I'm sure a lot of you guys came for the title of the video, which is something to the effect of, it's something about Trump's impeachment, right? There's a lot happening at this moment. And something I've noticed with my YouTube channel is the fact that anytime I talk politics, the numbers are really, really low. Like it gets almost no views on YouTube. But if I, when I upload the podcast to like, you know, CastBox and iTunes and Google Play and Stitcher and all that other stuff, the numbers are way up. Like it's super popular. It's a really popular subject on podcasts. I wonder if it's like YouTube censoring it or something. I don't know. I probably just got like uh, demonetized for that, but who cares? You know, this is my YouTube channel where this is the channel I talk about whatever the fuck I want to talk about. And I don't care about my language. I don't care about the subjects or any of that other stuff. People will either watch or they won't. And I know that people will watch, uh, especially listen in podcast form. That This seems to be a pretty popular thing in the in the podcast realm. So tell you what, why don't we take a look at this impeachment situation with Trump? Because there has been some breaking news with it recently. So this website, the first website I wanted to look at was, I think, CBS. Yeah, CBS News. So let's start at the top here. The latest news on the impeachment inquiry. The House voted mostly along party lines to approve a resolution establishing the procedures for the impeachment inquiry's next phase. The vote was 232 to 196, with two Democrats joining all Republicans in voting against passage. The resolution lays out the framework for public hearings and eventual proceedings in, ju in the Judiciary Committee, which would craft any potential articles of impeachment. Let me explain how impeachment works as far as I understand it now. I'm no expert on politics, but I keep up with it fairly closely. So bear with me through it, and I'll see if I can describe it as, as well as I understand it. Impeachment does not mean getting kicked out of office um, automatically. That's not necessarily what impeachment is. We've seen the words impeachment inquiry thrown around a lot. That's because an impeachment is actually just basically an investigation into the president. Like, should we put him on trial for crimes and then kick him out of office for those crimes? That's really what an impeachment is. It's just, a, uh, it, it starts out as an inquiry to see an investigation to see what we do, what the next steps are. And then it moves to an impeachment trial. For the trial to move forward, from my understanding, the House of Representatives, which is, um, there are a total of 538 congressmen, and Congress includes the House of Representatives and the Senate, okay? There are two senators per state for a total of 100. So 538 congressmen total minus the 100 senators is 438 House members, House of Representatives. I... I I believe I got that right. If that's incorrect, you can check the comments or the description in the podcast or on YouTube for the correction, but that's my understanding of it. So we got 438 people, um, which basically splits, they each represent a different district in a different state. So in West Virginia, where I live, you've got like district number one, number two, and number three. So the next step after the House of Representatives votes on whether or not to go forward with an impeachment trial is the Supreme Court holds the trial and the Senate acts as the judges. I'm sorry, acts as the jurors, the jury members. So what's here's what would happen if Trump were to go to impeachment trial, for example. He would sit in front of the Supreme Court and the senators would sit there hear out the case, and they would vote one way or another to kick him out of office, basically. That's my understanding of the situation. Like I said, it's a very, very complex process. And if I made some minor error in this, just check the description and there will be an update to it. But that's, that's my understanding of it. So let's give this article a read now a little bit further down and see what it has to say about the impeachment process so far. 
The House voted along party lines mostly to approve a resolution establishing the procedures for the impeachment inquiry's next phase. The vote was 232 to 196, with two Democrats joining all Republicans in voting against passage. So it's an extremely partisan situation. That's really, really sad to me. This shouldn't be partisan. I don't want to see all Republicans voting for one thing and all Democrats voting for another thing. I don't feel like it should be like that. That's a sign that the system is broken to me. The resolution lays out the framework for public hearings and eventual proceedings in the Judiciary Committee, which would craft any potential articles of impeachment. A resolution authorizing public hearings and laying the groundwork for eventual proceedings in the Judiciary Committee passed by a vote of 232 to 196. All but two Democrats voted for the measure, with all Republican members voting against it. The chamber's sole independent joined Democrats in voting for a passage. Three Republicans and one Democrat did not cast a vote. Interesting. Sadly, this is not any cause for any glee or comfort. This is something that is very solemn, that is prayerful. Why is it prayerful? I thought there was a separation of church and state situation going on here. Nothing in the Senate or the House or any other branch of government should be prayerful. (laughs) Whatever. It's going to continue. Not going to freak out. Just going to continue. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said ahead of the vote. Of course it was Nancy Pelosi. I doubt anybody in this place or anybody that you know comes to Congress to take the oath of office comes to Congress to impeach the President of the United States unless his actions are jeopardizing or honoring our oath of office. Weirdly worded. The vote was the first time the full House weighed in on the impeachment inquiry after weeks of Republican objections that Democrats were proceeding without a floor vote on the merits of the probe. Democrats dismissed those criticisms and argued such a vote to open an inquiry is not required under the Constitution, but introduced Thursday's resolution nonetheless, stressing the inquiry is already underway. Okay, so this was a vote basically to allow for the inquiry in the first place. So the Speaker of the House, which is Nancy Pelosi, a Democrat, pushed forward the impeachment inquiry, and Republicans were unhappy about the fact that they didn't take a floor vote from every congressperson. Uh, So they did. So they took the the floor vote, and um, it passed. So the inquiry is moving forward, and it's 100% legal and above board in every way so far. The House has formally pursued impeachment just three other times in U.S. history. Two presidents, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton, were eventually impeached but acquitted in Senate trials. Fascinating. I didn't know about Andrew Johnson. The third, Richard Nixon, resigned when it became clear he would be impeached by the House and removed by the Senate. Prior to the vote, Republican leaders denounced what they called the Soviet-style nature of the investigation thus far, citing the use of closed-door hearings and lack of due process for the president. Interesting. Well, the the whole situation is, by its very nature, open door. Like, the... I understand the investigation is probably closed-door. I have no issue with investigations being closed-door necessarily for the sake of, you know, not tainting information or evidence or anything like that. But the trial itself is going to be open door. There's no way around that. The Senate is going to sit as the jurors and judge whether or not the president should be able to whatever, whether he should be kicked out of office or not. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what they mean by closed door because it it just does not make any sense in that context to me. The resolution approved Thursday authorizes the House Intelligence Committee to hold public hearings and craft a report to be delivered to the Judiciary Committee, where President Trump and his counsel will have the right to cross-examine witnesses and review evidence. Republicans can request testimony from witnesses in either committee, subject to approval of the Democratic chairman or a full committee vote. After receiving the report and holding its own hearings, the Judiciary Committee would be responsible for drafting any eventual articles of impeachment. There you go. So there's another article I wanted to look at, um, and it's called Fact Check. Is the Trump impeachment process different from Nixon and Clinton? So let's read this article. This is from NPR. Let's just see how it differs. So this starts out, it says, For the third time in almost 46 years, the House of Representatives has voted to begin a formal impeachment inquiry, which means they're starting an investigation into the actions of the sitting president. As we read earlier, is Andrew Johnson, uh, Nixon, Clinton, and now Trump, I guess. 
uh, total ever, from my understanding. And despite criticisms from President Trump, whose press secretary Stephanie Grisham called the resolution unfair, unconstitutional, and fundamentally un-American, the measure lawmakers approved Thursday charts a course similar to that of the inquiries into Presidents Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton. It's not unconstitutional. They are, they are following the Constitution here completely, 100%. Uh, I, I'm really unclear about what's unconstitutional about this or really what's unfair about it. This is the job. This is why we voted these people into office to hold various different branches accountable. I would have absolutely no issue with this if there was an impeachment inquiry against, you know, a Democrat instead of a Republican. I would love to get to the bottom of things. Um, and this is an issue that's worthy of getting to the bottom of. Like, whether it's a legitimate issue or not, whether there was a quid pro quo with Trump or, or not, whatever the case, does not matter. That we should be allowed to investigate. That seems obvious to me. I don't understand what's unfair about that, or unconstitutional, or un-American. This is literally the American process. It couldn't possibly be more American than this. It says, The process allows for the investigation led by House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff, a Democrat from California, to continue with the next phase, including public hearings. Up till now, most of the investigation has been closed-door depositions involving Democrats and Republicans on three House panels, Intelligence Committee, Oversight, and Foreign Affairs Committees. The process seems very fair to me, said former Republican Representative Tom Campbell, who served in the House during the Clinton proceedings and voted for impeachment. He called the current plan very consistent with how the House operates in the two previous impeachment matters. Due process. This is a subheading here. Trump and Republican allies argue that uh, that he and the GOP do not have enough power in the proceedings. Well, that's kind of the fucking nature of an impeachment. You don't have any power here because you're on trial. A defendant doesn't have power in a trial. They are being accused of something. White House Press Secretary Grisham said that with Thursday's vote, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats have done nothing more than enshrine unacceptable violations of due process into House rules. I just want to point something out real quick. Um, It's talking about the Speaker of the House here. Nancy Pelosi's the Speaker of the House. Before Nancy Pelosi was Paul Ryan... He was a Republican. And I think, I could be wrong here, I believe that Nancy Pelosi was actually the Speaker of the House before Paul Ryan, too. So it went Pelosi, Paul Ryan, and then Pelosi again. The Speaker of the House is third in line to become president if something were to happen. Like if there's like a, a, you know, a plane crash or something, and the Vice President and the President are decommissioned and, you know, incapable of fulfilling their duties then it goes to Speaker of the House. And then I think it goes to the Supreme Court Chief Justice, which is John Roberts at the moment, I believe. Anyway, continuing on with the article. Republican lawmakers have been allowed equal time for questioning in the closed-door depositions. They'll be allowed to request subpoenas and witnesses for the open hearings, but those would have to be approved by the Democrats. Schiff will eventually turn his findings over to the House Judiciary Committee, which would begin the formal process of determining whether to draw up articles of impeachment. House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler, a Democrat from New York, has laid out additional details about the minority's um, about the minority party's role for his panel. So there are obviously two primary political parties in our system. There's the, uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. There are other parties, but they're not really, um, they're not really well represented in, in our political system. Like there's the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, the Independent Party, so on and so forth. The, the two primary ones are Republican and Democrat, right? In Congress, we have the minority party and the majority party. So right now, I think Democrats represent the majority in the House of Representatives. And that means there's going to be a majority leader and a minority leader. So the majority leader is going to be um, the person who uh, 
handles a lot of the stuff for the Democrats. Like they they handle pushing bills and getting votes and things like that. And then there's the minority leader, which in this case would be the Republican. Uh, I'm not sure who the minority leader is at this moment for the Republicans. And then there's something called the whip. That's getting a little bit more complicated. They they go around and pressure people to vote the way they want them to vote. They're right below the minority leader. The president or his attorneys will be allowed to cross-examine witness and subpoena their own, although they'll need a majority vote or the concurrence of the chair to do so. They'll also be allowed to attend all hearings of the Judiciary Committee, including any that are closed to the public. Democrats say that these same rights were given to the minority party with Clinton in the late 90s and Nixon in the mid-70s. The resolution also says that if the president unlawfully refuses to cooperate with congressional requests, Nadler can deny requests by the president or his counsel an apparent attempt to counter Trump's lack of cooperation with requests for documents and witnesses. Another talking point for Republicans is that the investigation has been largely hidden from public view. I feel like that's part of the reason behind that is because Republicans and Trump more specifically are really good at gaining public favor, garnering public favor. And I think people are a little concerned that if they released it publicly, Trump and or the Republicans would find a way to kind of soften the details and make it a little bit less realistic or blunt as it is. That's that's my assumption about what they think might happen. It says, um, it is, by any definition, a process that is an attempt in secret in the basement of the Capitol to unseat a duly elected president of the United States, said House Republican Conference Chair Liz Cheney on Thursday. It's unlike anything we've ever seen before. We've seen this before, and it is 100% constitutional. It's enshrined in the Constitution. We have this process to protect the American people from abuse of power. So, But both the Clinton and Nixon investigations had a mix of closed and open phases. Independent counsel Kenneth Starr's investigation into Clinton also used closed-door interviews and grand jury proceedings that were not open to Congress until later. The Nixon investigation was a bit different. It started out as investigation into the Watergate break-in, noted Thomas Allen Schwartz, a professor of history and political science at Vanderbilt University. So there were, of course, the very famous Watergate hearings in the summer of 73 that went on at great length that were sort of a national obsession, he said. And the question, you know the famous Howard Baker question, what did the president know and when did he know it? After the Watergate hearings ended, though, the Judiciary Committee also conducted several closed-door hearings as it proceeded with impeachment. So here's the, uh, the subheading called Key Differences. These are the key differences between the different impeachment hearings. Campbell, who now teaches law at Chapman University, says one difference between the process this time and when Clinton was impeached was the information lawmakers had. In 1998, he says, House members voted to authorize an impeachment inquiry only after they received the Starr report. Kenneth Starr, the report that Kenneth Starr turned in. Starr investigated, among other things, whether Clinton lied about the affair he had with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. This is, like, such a ridiculous impeachment inquiry, like, over Clinton, I mean, over Bill Clinton. Who cares if the dude did this? I don't know. Like, I'm just looking at this with hindsight glasses right now, and it seems like such an absurd thing to freak out about and and try to get a president impeached over. Um, In the end, they impeached him over lying under oath about sleeping with her or not. That sounds so ridiculous to me, honestly. Whatever, you know? It is what it is. It's over now. So anyway, let's just continue with this and see what else it has to say. These are the key differences between Clinton and Trump's impeachment. So in that sense, Campbell said, every member of the House had available to her or him the findings of this special prosecutor. Now, in this case, that's not so, unless one refers to Robert Mueller's report. Another difference, looking back to the Watergate era, is the political climate. 
something else to make note of about Watergate is the fact that really one of the biggest issues with Watergate wasn't what happened necessarily. I mean, that was bad enough, but it was what he did to try to cover it up. That was one of the really serious problems. Like he, he tried to bribe people and everything. It was ugly. Anyway, let's continue on. This president retains a very strong support within his party in a way that Richard Nixon really lost or did not have the same degree of loyalty. Professor Schwartz says, he also has a media platform that Nixon did not have. The media environment was very different. It's true. Twitter didn't even exist back then. The internet didn't exist back then, really. Not as it does now, anyway. The bipartisan nature of the Nixon impeachment inquiry had evaporated by the time Clinton was impeached. Michigan Democrat John Conyers argued against impeaching Clinton on the House floor at the time, saying, I am witnessing the most tragic event of my career in Congress. In effect, a Republican coup d'etat in process. The era of partisanship and polarization present then is still very much present today, as evidenced by Grisham's charge that the Democrats are choosing every day to waste time on a sham impeachment, a blatantly partisan attempt to destroy the president. It's not partisan. The accusations made are very, very serious. This is not over like it was with Clinton. The accusations are serious. True or not, whether they're true or not, they're serious. And an inquiry into the claims, at the very least, is warranted. The fact that, the, you know, that these people, Grisham and others, are freaking out and saying we shouldn't even be investigating it, it's a sham is disturbing to me. First up, coming from Emily, how do you feel about family vlogging channels with religious undertones? Do you think to some extent they're brainwashing kids with religious preaching? I, that's an interesting point. I think that brainwashing probably isn't the right word in this case. I think that subtly influencing is definitely happening, like subtle influence is happening. And that's concerning. I've talked about undue influence in the past. Let me give you an example of undue influence. You've got a Jehovah's Witness family. They raise this child of theirs to the age of 10 to be a Jehovah's Witness, right? Everything that they do, they take them to every meeting. They have them knocking on doors every weekend. They have them studying every week with the family. They have them reading the Bible every night before they go to sleep. So this kid turns 10, and... By this point in time, the kid feels like they're ready to get baptized. Is the kid's decision to get baptized 100% completely their informed choice? Or was it heavily influenced by what, they're, by what they were being told by people around them? A 10-year-old is, I would venture to say, incapable of making a decision as serious as that. If a 10-year-old isn't old enough to legally make a decision like getting married, which is going to affect them for the rest of their lives, they shouldn't legally be allowed to make another decision that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives, like getting baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. That's undue influence. The kid can scream until they're blue in the face that they believe that they, you know, they believe in Jehovah, they want to get baptized, they believe all of it, and they know what they're doing, and they know that they're making the right choice. They can scream that until they're blue in the face, does not make it true. Bottom line. So that's undue influence. Getting back to the original question here, what was it? I had it pinned here a second ago, but what was the original question again? The, the original question was, how do you feel about religious uh, vlogging or vlogging channels with religious undertones and kids? Right. That's not causing undue influence, I wouldn't say. It's causing some level of influence, but not to that extent. Not like you'd see with Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. I find it concerning that they're influencing people like that generally. That, that is very concerning. And I feel like one good way of countering that is by using the platform that I have on YouTube and talking about it. That's a prob this probably a pretty solid way of countering it. I wish there were more solid ways to do it. But brainwashing differs a little bit in the sense that what I'm talking about with undue influence, that's called mind control. Brainwashing is an accelerated, forced mind control through things like intimidation and f 
fear tactics and things like that. Like when a group, you know, captures somebody, puts them in a basement for three weeks, a regular old standard U.S. citizen, and when they walk out those doors three weeks later, they're suddenly extreme socialists. That's brainwashing. Cults don't really operate that way, typically. The military operates that way. And we can talk about whether or not, you know, that's ethical or whatever. But that, that is how it operates. That, that would be brainwashing. That's an example of it. Uh, using force and intimidation to, ex- in an accelerated way, control people. Uh, Ran had asked, what do you think of GDP Grey? He makes political videos about such topics. Have you seen his videos before? I think that's CGP Gray. <laughs> I actually do know CGP Gray. Awesome YouTube channel. I love that channel. Uh, sometimes they get a little bit in the weeds with things, and it gets kind of loses my attention a little, you know. But it's a fascinating channel. I love it to death. They've taught me a lot. They talk a lot about politics and how our political system operates in the U.S. and how it differs from other countries and how we can improve it and things. I feel like there's an issue right now in the U.S. where we want to be Americans to the death, just bleed red, white, and blue, you know? And and that's great, 100% with you on that. But some other countries have some other ideas that objectively work better. So let's try to incorporate some of those good ideas into our red, white, and blue system that we're so for, you know. I I believe in this country, but I believe that it can be better than it is, and I want to find ways to do that. Believing that the country is already as good as it could possibly be is a disturbing concept. It means it can do no wrong, and that's going down a scary road. So, uh, This one is from Trigor. Uh, what are your views on euthanasia? Okay, euthanasia. Give me one second. I want to make sure we're on the same page here. Let me define euthanasia for you. The painless killing of a patient suffering from an incurable and painful disease or in an irreversible coma. The practice is illegal in most countries. When I was in college, I wrote a paper on... Um, Physician-assisted suicide, basically, whether or not we should allow it. So there are people like cancer patients who are terminal, not going to last another six months, and they are absolutely miserable. They, it's, it's a horrific life that they have to live for the next six months. So the question is, should we allow them to do it in their own way and in their own time? Or should we basically force them to follow through with a painful, terrible, horrific death? And my my take on it is there are a lot of people who are very depressed and, and face these types of feelings, um, and so it's complicated. I am 100% for the preservation of life as much as possible, in as many cases as possible. But if a patient has been found to be of sound mind and has a terminal incurable illness that is going to take their lives in the next, say, year, for example, I think they should be allowed to go through with that in their own time. I've actually seen it happen. Like, I've watched the process unfold before um, in a video. I think it was even in a psychology class. A guy was terminally ill, uh, and he, he was still capable of walking around and talking and communicating with family members, but he did not have long. He had, like, four weeks max. That was it. And so the doctor gave him a prescription for some medicine, and it basically puts him to sleep, and then it's over. So what he did was he he takes the medicine, he, he eats it, and he has uh, a violinist there with him, and his whole family is around him, and they're all talking to him and having a fun time and 
hanging out and reminiscing with him until he just falls asleep and then it's done. He went in his own way in his own time and and it was like he maintained his dignity through the process. I I can respect that and I feel like it should be one of our choices as human beings to be able to do that. But there should most definitely be restrictions on it. You should be of sound mind. You should either be over a certain age or you should be terminally ill or both. On a lighter note, uh, Omega asks, did Alpha Force Zero go trick-or-treating? If so, what did she dress up as? She did go trick-or-treating, actually. See, this is one thing about trick-or-treat. I love Halloween. I love trick-or-treat. She went as Celia from Descendants 3. I'll show you a picture of Celia. I'm not going to... Uh, I don't. I don't even know if I have any pictures of uh, Kylie dressed up. Um, maybe on my phone, but not like on my computer to show you guys. Anyway, let me show you. This is a picture of Celia from Descendants Three. It's the one with the tiny little itty bitty hat here. That's how Kylie dressed up, and it was a fun time. Collected lots of candy and all that good stuff. I used to go to houses and tell people that I was collecting candy for Kylie's little sister who was too young to collect candy. Total bullshit. She doesn't even have a little sister. Uh, I just collect it for myself. Actually, she has a half-sister, but she's not really involved in my life in, in any way. So I used to collect it for myself because you know what? I didn't get to collect this shit when I was little. I'm going to collect it now. And if somebody wants to give me shit over it, then they can go fuck themselves as far as I'm concerned. If I want to collect candy then i'm gonna collect candy i don't care if i am 30 <laughs> uh i didn't collect this year uh for the record though i probably not gonna collect anymore i had my time of collecting and it was fun i did it for about five years and it was a good time got lots and lots of candy but uh ryan had asked uh why do you like bernie why do i like bernie sanders that's a good question um because he seems really genuine he's got a near spotless record Dude's been saying the same thing for 50 years, practically. I don't know. Since the 80s. He's been just delivering the same message since the 1980s. So 40 years, I guess. 30 or 40. Very consistent. Very honest. Spotless record. And he also stands for things that I stand for, too. He's very liberal. He's progressive. He believes in equality of everybody. He believes in Medicare for all. I also believe in that. Believes in tuition-free college. I am so for all of his policies. Now, there are other people out there like... Um, well, there, there are other people out there who agree with his assessments with some things. Um, and I wouldn't be too broken up if they got the nomination instead of him. I really want to see Bernie get the nomination, but... You know what? If Warren gets it... It'll be okay with me. Um, there are a few politicians out there who I'd be okay with getting the nomination. One of the main factors driving my feelings on who gets the nomination, who I do want and I don't want, is who do I think is going to lose against the whoever happens to be the nominee in the Republican Party. Joe Biden is almost certainly going to lose if he's facing up against anybody in the Republican Party, no matter who it is, I, I think. I mean, maybe he could win, who knows? But it, it just seems to me like he has a really, he has a far lower chance of winning the general election than, say, Bernie or Warren or whoever. Um, so, anyways, consistency is what I'd say. Consistency, and I really like his policy positions a lot, all of them. I think I agree with him on just about every single policy position. I, I haven't seen one yet that I disagree with him on. So, Church of Scientology ta taking over a Florida city faster than anyone thought. This is a blog article by The Friendly Atheist again. This is written by David G. It kind of caught my attention because uh, I haven't really talked about this a whole lot, but I actually lived in this city for like a couple of years, recently even. Like within the past five years or so, I lived here in this city. Um, so I wanted to give this article a read and see what it had to say. It says, the church, and I'm using that term loosely, of Scientology is stepping up its efforts to take over the city of Clearwater, Florida, 
rapidly buying up waterfront land where the organization and its members already owned a substantial piece of the real estate market. Scientology has never been scared of wielding its power as well as its status as a tax-exempt organization to grow the church. The latest actions are no exception, but it is amazing. That's weird. It is amazing. Why didn't they put an apostrophe S in there? That, that's weird. Anyway, but it's amazing how much of this flew under the radar until now. Reporters at the Tampa Bay Times broke the story via a thorough analysis of property records and dozens upon dozens of interviews. That doesn't surprise me. That's actually really good to hear that they broke the story. I, I knew that the Scientology headquarters was in Clearwater. It's r just a stone's throw from, um, from Tampa. Really, really close to Tampa. I used to drive to Clearwater all the time. I lived in Tampa for a while, for a couple of years. And Clearwater is beautiful. Uh, it's on the Gulf of Mexico, and there are beaches there, a whole bunch of beaches. Scientology is headquartered in Clearwater. Did not know that at the time. This is before I started YouTube at all. Actually, Hulk Hogan lives in Clearwater and owns a beach there. I think it's called Hogan Beach. And it's really cool. They got like jet skiing and, and stuff like that there. I've done all of that at Hogan Beach. It's a beautiful beach. I, I'm honestly not a huge fan of the Gulf beaches because they've got white sand and like dark blue water. I don't know. I just prefer clear water instead of dark blue water. And funny enough, clear water does not have clear water. So anyway... Going on with the article here, it says, The Church of Scientology, this is from the Tampa Bay Times. The Church of Scientology and companies run by its members spent $103 million over the past three years buying up vast sections of downtown Clearwater. Did not know that. I've been to downtown Clearwater a billion times. Walked all over there. Um, used to hang out there with friends and stuff. They now own most commercial property on every block within walking distance of the waterfront putting the secretive church firmly in control of the area's future. Most of the sales have not previously been reported. The Tampa Bay Times discovered them by reviewing more than a thousand deeds and business records, then interviewed more than 90 people to reconstruct the circumstances surrounding the transactions. Even city leaders said they didn't know the full extent of the purchases until they were shown maps created by the Times. That's scary, man. Seriously, that is scary. All this stuff owned by Scientology. Clearwater is a big deal. There are a lot of famous people that live in Clearwater. The fact that even local officials were baffled by how quickly the church has snatched up Clearwater property says a lot. We're talking about 185 properties covering 101 acres downtown. Half of those properties were purchased in the last two years, according to the Times' Tracy McManus. The land grab started as tensions grew between the church and the Clearwater City Council. Each had proposed major redevelopment projects designed to lure new business into the empty storefronts that surrounded the city-owned waterfront and the church's spiritual headquarters. Then the council interfered with a land deal that Scientology demanded for its plan. The church stopped communicating with the city. Almost immediately, a decades-long trickle of purchases by church members turned into a flood. This appears to be nothing more than a desperate reach for power, by a church that has long been known for abusing its members financially and emotionally. It's very true. It's an organized plot to control a city and strip local lawmakers of their power. It may be working. What's unclear is how all the properties will transform the city into a religious haven that makes the church even more powerful. That's scary. Uh, that's really concerning, I especially since it hits so close to home. Like, I... You know, I lived there. Like, I, I went there every weekend, me and Kylie both. We would go there and hang out. We, they had these glass blowers there. Uh, they would stand in a window, and they would, like, make glass stuff. And we would stand there and watch the glass blowing and everything. That's really, really scary stuff that they're doing that. It really sad, really concerning. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I'm trying to make a shirt design for every cult I've covered. I haven't gotten every one, but I'm working on it. So check it out and see if your cult is up there. 
Second, you can support me by checking out my game shop. I sell controller, cartridge, and game box stands for every system from the original Nintendo and Sega Game Gear to the Xbox One and Nintendo Switch. So give that a look too. And finally, if you want to support me in some way other than monetarily, you can check out my other YouTube channels. I have a retro game channel where I answer questions like, why does Shy Guy have a mask? And why are CRT TVs the best way to play retro games? I also have the podcast where I talk about stuff I don't feel I can say on a monetized channel. And finally, I have my main channel, where I talk about cults. I wish I didn't have to worry about dancing around subjects carefully in the first place, but I chose to do this as a full-time job, so unfortunately, I rely on YouTube's AdSense and on the support of patrons to continue doing the work I do. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.